Japanese Satsuki Azaleas. Love them or hate them, they're everywhere in Monzo. Uh, they're certainly not my favourite thing for reasons I'll explain, but uh, we buy a lot of collections of Monzo these days, and pretty much every time we do, we get some Azaleas, which is what I've got here. Now, one of the problems that I have is that I live near the coast. The sea is exactly two miles of that way. And the issue with that is that uh, it keeps the temperatures lower in the summer and uh, in the winter it keeps the temperatures warmer. So with 10 miles inland when everybody's suffering in 30 degrees, we're in 20 degrees. And also over the summer I live uh, on the east coast and it's one of the driest parts of the country. So in the summer when it's warm it's really dry, the atmosphere is really dry and an azalea is a plant that's really adapted to growing in very warm, very humid, steamy environments. Uh, I've never been to Japan and I've never studied growing azaleas so what I'm going to give you today is really just my own experience over the last 35 uh, odd years messing with these trees in my part of the world. And like I say, because it's very dry in the summer and it's very humid and then in the spring it tends to be very cold. I mean, I'm sitting here at the beginning of April uh, still having to wear a coat because it's flipping cold out there. And uh, so these just really don't grow very much at all. Now I've read lots of books and I've looked at lots of magazines and over the years seen what people can do with these in other places. but where I live that just can't be done and trying to cultivate uh, azaleas in my area is a bit like trying to keep a goldfish in a box of tissues. Now I actually know about that because when I was a kid I had a little tank that my dad bought me and I had a couple of goldfish and I've been messing with them one day as you do when you're little and I left the lid off and at some point one of the fish jumped out of the tank and ended up in a box of tissues. I don't know how long it had been there, but we uh, we found it and my dad pulled it out, popped it in the water, moved it up and down, got it restarted uh, and it survived. So for a while there I had a goldfish swimming around in his tank wearing a white fluffy furry coat. Uh, he did okay, I had him for several years and then he went into a fish pond and became enormous. But an azalea is not quite so straightforward. Because the atmosphere here is not uh, particularly suited to the cultivation of them, uh, they tend to be a tree that gets quite weak after a time and I know that traditionally you would just cut that big back into old wood like we would say a Chinese elm or a trident maple or any form of acer uh, and they should just regrow. But here you cut them back and you cut all the branches back into old wood, half of the branches die, uh, the rest of them tend to sprout from the base and we never ever manage to re recover the uh, ramification that we got when the trees came from Japan. Now if you listen to gardeners they'll always tell you right plant right place and in my opinion these azaleas are the right plant but definitely in the wrong place when it comes to my garden. Now the primary reason for growing satsuki in this country not least of all because they're relatively cheap in comparison with other Japanese varieties uh, but everybody grows them for the amazing show of flowers and it almost doesn't seem to matter what terrible estate they're in, they will always throw up flowers. Uh, flowering here takes usually up to about a month uh, and everybody hangs on to the flowers till right to the end and that's not really the best thing to do. And then when the flowers are finished, at the base of the flowers, the new shoots begin to emerge. Well here that's usually July. Uh, and then before you know it, mid-August, the nights are cooling down and the, and, and the temperature is starting to, uh, to drop quite quickly as the day length begins to shorten. And so no sooner are the flowers beginning to fade and the new, gro and the new growth begins to appear than the summer's already over. So it's just a really, really difficult thing. And even with a polytunnel like I have here, uh, it's still very difficult to get them to really push. You can get them to grow quite well in the summer. I've tried in the past covering the benches with capillary matting, keeping it really wet, really humid, and they grow phenomenally. As soon as you put them outside, all that new growth tends to collapse because it's very soft, and it also grows very late in the season and doesn't have time to harden off before the winter gets here. And so, they're a pain in the ass for me in my garden. 
Uh, my garden is better suited to growing pines and olives and things like that because it's wide open, it gets sunlight all the time and it's hammered by northeasterly winds, northerly winds, northwesterly winds, easterly winds. The only winds that don't really bother us are southerly winds. And so for me these really are pl plants that are in the wrong place. Now you can, like I say, you can get clever uh, with a greenhouse and heaters and all sorts of things but that is such a pain in the ass to have to do. Uh, so they're really just really really difficult. But one of the things I've discovered over the years is that, uh, this is what I'm doing with this little one here, is removing the flowers. If we remove the flowers, the tree will grow twice. That means it can grow, you can cut it, and then it will grow again. And in that instance, you can then build a little bit of ramification each year. It's painfully slow, but you can do it. Now, if you live in another part of the country, say on the west coast, uh, where the, the climate is a little bit milder and wetter, I dare say they do really well. But if you live on my side of the country, these are not an easy thing to deal with. But like I say, with removing the flowers, uh, they will grow twice. And so that means they can fill out quite quickly, <clears throat> uh, certainly more so than would be without removing the flowers. It's just really, really tedious to do. Uh, but that's what I'm sitting here doing. And when I've done this one, I've got this one here and I've got a couple more outside. Now these are trees that came from uh, a private collection recently and they're very typical of what we tend to see with azaleas in this country. Now, one of the things I've noticed with azaleas, you don't want to repot too often. Uh, azaleas, for me, they don't do well unless they're really tight in the pot. If they're pushing hard against the side of the pot, they're gonna grow okay. But repotting too often seems to be a little bit of a mistake. It seems to set them back and uh, it takes them a long time here to fill a pot with root. That's probably completely the opposite to what happens in Japan. I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked at azaleas in Japan. I haven't been there, so I don't know. But I know what happens here. And so removing the buds, uh, the flower buds, is really important to the restoration of a tree and these trees here uh, I'm working uh, just starting on restoring those it's a shame when we buy collections most often most of the trees we get need to be restored and with a tree like a maple you can restore that in two three five years no problem at all elms you could do in a couple of years uh, but some other trees particularly evergreens pines things that only grow once a year much more difficult and unfortunately here an azalea falls into that grows once a year category and of course if a tree makes a shoot and that shoot grows and you cut it and then nothing else happens it's really really difficult to try and make any uh, any progress we want trees that are going to grow four five six times in the year we can then prune build ramification branch structure and so on and so forth so that's much easier to develop uh, develop azaleas uh, sorry it's much easier to develop anything that's growing fast trees that don't grow fast they're obviously not going to develop very quickly <clears throat> and so I'm very late because I've only just got these in the last week uh, and it's April begin just the beginning of April here and so I'm a little bit late removing the buds on here there's another one at the back here that I removed the, the flower buds from in January and I'll show you that in a while and you'll see how much further on that is than these trees because these these have been in a greenhouse a uh, nice greenhouse with good light and well taken care of over the winter obviously they've dropped their leaves so they look at uh, most of their leaves so they look a little bit thin but like i say the one i took the buds out of earlier very weak very poorly looking tree but it's already uh, just in a couple of a couple of months a few weeks starting to show some real progress so for preference i would remove flower buds uh, January, February, there's not a lot going on that time of year and it's lovely sitting out in the freezing cold when the temperature's two degrees, two or three degrees above freezing doing this fine and delicate work with a little pair of tweezers but you know that's bonsai, not all of it is glamorous work, a lot of it is just dull, tedious and repetitious but that's what you, uh, that's what you have to do if you're going to create really interesting bonsai uh, and so before I get into anything else, let me just show you exactly what I'm doing with this tree and how to remove these flower buds. So looking at this little shoot here, we can use these pair of tweezers and, and if you look, there's a little rosette of leaves here. There we go, round like that. And that little guy in the middle, that's a flower bud. Now if we take a nice pair of tweezers, just put them by the tip of that bud 
slide it down towards the base you want to be on the bottom quarter of the bud and then just gently turn it and there it comes just out as easily as that so slide down the bud to the bottom give it a little turn obviously support the shoot with your hand because azalea shoots quite brittle uh, they can quickly uh, they can very easily break so you support right behind the leaves with your fingers down the bud twist pop and there it goes taking a closer look at this I've got most of the flower buds out of here but you can see there's no new growth all of these leaves are what grew last uh, last summer uh, this tree is actually being down in the south of England so I would expect it to be further on but you can see there's no new shoots there at all but uh, if we come over here and have a look at this one again quite a poor condition tree but where I took the buds out in January you can see already lots of uh, lots of new growth if I pick that one up the leaves above my finger are new and they've grown in the last uh, three or four weeks so you can see all over this tree there's all these lovely bright green shoots but now typically uh, certainly for me this wouldn't be the case now here's another one and again you can see the flower buds are all in there and there's no new growth the buds are just beginning some of the buds are just beginning to swell but you can see here no new growth at all lots of new growth and that is just literally down to removing the flower buds and so rather than putting all its energy into pumping up all those hundreds and hundreds of buds that these tend to make and they do tend to make uh, a bud more or less a flower bud in the end of every single shoot uh, that obviously sucks a lot of energy out of the tree because these varieties are great big fat blousy flowers and uh, they look amazing for about a day and then it rains and they all go soggy and they're just horrible anyway but uh, the fact that azaleas are not well suited to growing here doesn't mean to say that we can't grow them uh, but we're just going to have to modify our techniques to uh, allow that to uh, happen. Now I know to a lot of people it almost seems sacrilegious to be removing these uh, flower buds. For most people the only reason to own a satsuki is for flowers. I'm not a big flower guy. Anybody who wants to check just give my wife a call. Uh, she doesn't see flowers very often. Uh, for me flowers are nice enough but uh, I'm a bonsai guy and a tree should be bonsai first and foremost and that includes satsuki so if it's not a good looking tree uh, I'm not really that uh, that interested I certainly wouldn't own a satsuki just for the uh, just for the flowers so for me removing these flowers uh, and I end up with a lot more growth and I'm really happy with that now you could leave one or two flowers just for the interest but if you do you won't tend to get so much uh, of a benefit from removing the bulk of these flower buds because a tree tends to be in two modes it's either uh, a growth mode or a flowering mode so an old mature tree uh, that's uh, that's just growing steadily will tend to produce a lot more flowers than a young and vigorous tree and because satskis tend to end up getting quite weak in this country they tend to produce copious amounts of flowers and as I've already said certainly for me in my garden very little growth so if we leave a few flowers it does tend to suppress the growth of the rest of the tree so for me it's important to remove all of the flower buds if I want to get the tree to uh, produce new growth and removing these buds uh, is a really effective uh, a really effective way of achieving that now one of the other issues we have with Satsuki is the fact that the tree is what's known as basally dominant. What that means is the lower part of the tree will grow much more strongly than the upper part. Now most, uh, most trees are what's known as apically dominant. What that means is the tops of the tree, the ends of the branches grow more uh, and extend more than lower and inner parts. Uh, 
the actual ends of the shoots actually release hormones to suppress the inner growth. The reason for that is most trees are programmed to be as big as possible because the bigger you are the more seed you can produce uh, and the more uh, offspring that you can create and that's obviously what this is all about at the end of the day. Uh, and where azaleas tend to grow by all accounts they tend to grow in carpets and mounds and domes and so on and so forth and so they grow more strongly on the base of the tree than they do at the top now over a period of time in bonsai that leads to an issue whereby we tend to end up with nice big thick lower pads on the tree but the top starts to get really thin and you can't really see it here but this tree uh, is got a hole in the top and it's really thin now this is actually reasonably balanced because from the lower parts up to here uh, it's all fairly even but then the inner part uh, has largely disappeared and if we have a look at one or two of these other trees behind me uh, you'll see where that all goes hideously wrong and uh, there are ways to address that but it's not easy so let's just have a quick look at those so this tree belonged to a friend of mine he's had it I don't know 20 years and surprisingly he's grown most of these branches this came as a uh, root ball tree from Japan it's largely just a trunk uh, and at one point it was looking quite good but you can see here very clearly what I was saying about a tree being basically dominant so from this point you can see the pads are nice and thick as much as they ever get here uh, and you can see all the growth is on the lower half and if we look at the uh, the top of this long spindly thin nothing much going on at all we've got a little back bud here there's a cut here this branch died off there's a new bud come in here but if we were to just go over this and cut this back into old wood like we would say a maple or an elm uh, chances are a lot of that's not going to uh, to do much at all uh, if anything and we may end up losing the tree and then we've got to try and kind of create something new uh, with the bottom of it and that's just really crap and it really doesn't uh, doesn't work so if we just go over here and have a look at this other one and this is a tree I've only had a week but you can see this lower part great big branch on the bottom here look just thick full of twigs getting a bit leggy but reasonably good but as soon as we look at the top almost nothing here now it'd be nice to just cut that all back and start again but uh, like I say it's just not going to happen here not like it would in some parts of uh, parts of the world and so what we always have to bear in mind when we're working on azaleas is particularly if they're like this one is uh, where it's very strong in the base very weak in the top we need to cut much harder and really hold back the growth of these lower parts while allowing the top to grow now it's perfectly feasible to restore the top of these but it is going to take several years of pulling flower buds to really build the vigor of this tree up again and also careful control of these lower parts uh, so that the tree then starts to divert vigor to the upper part so if you have a look at this little one here you can see that's fairly even as we come up it but then you can you can see there big hole in the top and because azalea is very brittle we're not going to wire that so what we've got to do is lift the vigor of all of these trees and manage them very carefully and in doing so what we'll be able to do is progressively restore the tops of these and when they begin to get more vigorous we can cut back much harder and the back budding and the new growth will be much more predictable much more reliable exactly the same thing as you would do with say a deciduous tree uh, in as much as you're trying to but in that case suppress the growth of the apex and the end of the branches in favor of the stuff that's lower down and further in and these are the things that sort the men from the boys because really this tree this tree and to a greater extent this one as well have not been managed properly for many years and so as a consequence we've got this dramatic imbalance uh, and this pulling of flower buds is all part of what we need to do to actually begin to correct that situation so taking a closer look at this azalea you can see very clearly how these lower parts have become extremely basically dominant and the apex 
very thin, very weak. Now unless we start to take some action to correct this, I would say within three to four years, this is just going to die off and I'm too old to start to restore this tree, certainly in this country, so we need to start to uh, take some action to uh, improve this and so once again the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of all of these flower buds. Once I've done that, over the, over literally the whole tree, and then what I'm going to do is take opportunity to prune these lower branches back as much as I can because several of these have got growth further back and so I can push this back, reduce this lower part significantly uh, and then leave this untouched and then progressively hopefully this will start to then build up again. People always ask me about azaleas and what we should plant them in. By and large as long as it's on the uh, acidic side of the pH scale doesn't really matter. Uh, we tend to use canuma but if you live in a particularly wet part of the country you might find that canuma is almost too wet. In that case I would recommend a use a mix of uh, akadama and some pine bark and I've always found that does really well or if you've got pine forest near, near you and you can get hold of rotted uh, pine needle litter that is marvellous stuff for uh, getting these azaleas to grow but it's not something that you can get commercially and you need to be lucky to have it in woods close to you because they have to be fairly old woods but they're not in my experience particularly fussy as regards to their soil but what you do need is soft material in there because the roots of azalea are super super fine like hair and what they do is pass very quickly into the soil particles so that's the great thing about canuma that it's very soft and the roots grow into it through it and back out the other side and that's why people tend to think that satskis are always root bound because obviously the roots bind all the soil together but that's just how they naturally grow and in regards to repotting satskis, like I said, they seem to me that they do much better if they're tight in the pot and they're pushing hard against the side. But obviously there is a time when you need to repot. And in my experience here in my garden, the best time to do that is in the, uh, in the springtime. So just as the new shoots begin to show, uh, I would I would repot. So say this tree here, I could repot this today without any problem, although it doesn't need it, so I'm not going to. But, uh, and if I was going to repot, I would remove all the flower buds once again, because it then focuses the tree's attention on growing new root. And then when the new root comes, it pushes new shoots from everywhere. So. Uh, on occasions a repot can reinvigorate a tree but you are going to have to remove the flower buds first or you're not going to get the response that you would have uh, perhaps hoped for. As I said earlier Satsuki is a plant that likes lots of humidity. Now on a warm sunny summer's day in my garden I've typically got about 20% humidity unless it's pissing with rain in which case it's just freezing cold and that doesn't count. I'm under the impression that in Japan on a nice warm sunny summer's day you're more likely to see 90% or more humidity and that's the difference. Now I can grow olives like they're weeds, they just grow fantastically here but Satsuki because of that lack of atmospheric humidity tends to struggle. Now in the past I've uh, set up greenhouses with capillary matting and shading and stuff and got phenomenal growth so it can be done but it's not something that's just going to happen because you want it to it's something that you're really going to have to work at generally with plants they support each other so if you can keep satskis in a position where they're surrounded by other plants all nice and close that's going to help sticking them on a monkey pole in the middle of your lawn in direct sun where the wind's blowing underneath them they're going to end up struggling standing them on the side of a pond where the wind's blowing across the top is going to do nothing but by bringing plants together they all release humidity and they all support each other so if you can take a semi-shaded corner of your garden pop your azaleas there with uh, things like soft foliage maples like kihimis those type of things uh, they'll all support each other and when you're watering obviously and, and or it's raining everything is wet or it's uh, uh, you, you've got mildew 
mildew. You've got dew at night, uh, and obviously that all helps to raise the relative humidity. But it's something that we're always going to uh, we're always going to struggle with here. But the more you can do uh, to improve the situation, the better. Now. It's not a problem keeping a Satsuki in full sun in this country because full sun in this country is not the same as full sun in a lot of other countries. And so you can keep them in full sun, uh, but ideally you want to keep them out of uh, strong strong winds and drying winds, especially if you get very warm winds like you do sometimes in the summer. Uh, you want to try and avoid that. But generally, if you can put them in a part shaded part of the garden in very good, uh, very good light, some sun throughout the day, uh, and lots of plants all together they're going to be much happier now a lot of people would say well you just missed them but that's not really going to help because that's water it's not atmospheric humidity and there tends to be problems with trees if we're just constantly keeping them wet all the time we tend to get fungal issues and root rot and all sorts of other things so having lots of plants together in an area uh, keeping the wind uh, at bay as best we can is going to really help so Anything we can do to uh, improve the atmospheric humidity around azalea is, is definitely going to make a big difference. And one of the other issues for Satsuki is they're what's known as an ericaceous plant. What that means is they don't like lime in their water and they don't like lime in their soil. They like very slightly acidic conditions. Now if you live in a part of the country where you've got acidic water coming out of the tap, uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, if you're conscientious enough to make sure you've got plenty of rainwater to use for Satsuki, that's absolutely fine. But uh, if, like most of us, that's just a little bit, uh, a little bit beyond you, and you're using tap water, that can that can be an issue if you've got very hard water. Now, where I live, my water is uh, certainly not acidic, but it's kind of kind of neutral, just a little bit on the alkaline side. Uh, and I can get I can get away with it. It's just about borderline, but I can get away with it. And one of the things I found really helpful uh, three, four times a year, give a Satsuki a good thorough water with sequestered iron. That's something you dissolve in water and uh, just pour it onto the soil. Uh, because in an acidic situation, iron tends to be leached out quite quickly so if you've got a satsuki that's very yellow and uh, quite pasty looking very often uh, a feed with a sequestered iron is going to help and then beyond that you just want to really use any organic fertilizer uh, not particularly a high nitrogen fertilizer I'd stay away from chicken manure and stuffing like that but uh, using a good organic fertilizer you will end up with a very slightly acidic situation typically so if you're using something like uh, biogold if you're using uh, green dream or lots of the other uh, organic fertilizers available rapeseed meal uh, rapeseed pellets also very very good but uh, azaleas are fairly adaptable but if you've got nasty horrible hard water and lime scale problems then uh, you need to do something about that now, it's possible to acidify your water slightly with an additive before you uh, go doing that but if you've got to be mixing something every time you want to water your trees uh, then I think that uh, that's just too much of a pain in the ass to contemplate in my opinion so uh, that certainly wouldn't be something I'd be looking at but generally if you can maintain uh, a slightly acidic situation within the soil you will find that your uh, your satsuki will uh, will do well and another thing I found is that uh, they're much more hardy than people give them credit for uh, over the years I've tried to overwinter satskis in the greenhouse uh, and I've also overwintered them outside and they seem to do much better if they're overwintered outside because they go properly dormant they shut down completely if it is a cold winter or particularly windy they will drop a lot of their leaves they get a good solid rest over the winter and then in the spring they tend to grow quite well now as I said at the beginning, I live near the coast, so we don't tend to see a lot of uh, a lot of frost. This winter, we've not seen more than minus one, and that certainly is not going to bother a Satsuki in any way, shape, or form. So I wouldn't uh, 
I wouldn't be too worried about overwintering these. I certainly wouldn't be putting them in a garage. Uh, you might want to keep them out of the worst of the winds if, like me, you live on the coast and you get howling gales. Uh, but uh, in general, they seem to be uh, cold hardy and they actually seem to benefit from being outside over the course of, uh, over the course of a winter. And realistically, I think that's probably all I've got to say about Satskis. As I say, they're certainly not my favourite thing, but because they're such a challenge, uh, I tend to stick with them. I've certainly never produced anything worth looking at, and to be honest, I doubt I will. But uh, all these little tricks that I've, I've found over the years certainly uh, help us to maintain these trees and keep them looking, uh, looking good, and they certainly prevent a lot of the issues that uh, this particular tree has got. And uh, but unfortunately, I keep buying them off other people who haven't done those things, and then I keep having to do all this again and again and again. And then as soon as they look good, somebody wants to buy them and take them away. So unfortunately, I can't show you a really nice-looking Satsuki today. But uh, you know, so it goes. You can't, have, you can't have everything. So. Hopefully that's given you a few ideas uh, about Satsuki and uh, growing them much like a goldfish in a box of tissues. So thanks for watching.